many ways, it's remarkable that the campaign that is most fated as the model for winning female suffrage around the world is the British one. Because the key organisation that is internationally known for its militancy and brutal treatment at the hands of the British ruling class, the Women's Social and Political Union, consciously folded its campaign without victory at the start of World War I in order to patriotically support the slaughter of millions. It wasn't until 1928 that women in the UK got equal voting rights to men, with only 40%, that is ruling class and middle class women, achieving it at the end of the war in 1918. But the model of the WSPU is much beloved by many bourgeois feminists, such as Jess Phillips, the British Labour MP, who recently wrote a foreword to a new edition of Emmeline Pankhurst's autobiography. To give you a little flavour of who Jess Phillips is, this is the MP who responded to the accusation that she was stabbing Jeremy Corbyn in the back by claiming that she told him, I won't knife you in the back, I'll knife you in the front. And the model of the WSPU is held up, I think, because the interpretation of how women won the vote nicely fits into a liberal feminist worldview that change is won by the actions of a heroic few, not mass mobilisations. That the specific advances for women are won by these radical few because they're prepared to martyr themselves for the cause. And actually, this is something that most people can't do in their normal lives. And that advances for oppressed groups come from the achievements of cross-class alliances and that these movements are led by bourgeois women who break glass ceilings or use their influence to gain us our rights. As Christabel Pankhurst put it, the House of Parliament shall be more impressed by the demonstrations of the feminine bourgeoisie than of the feminine proletariat. And these form the dominant views of women who claim the mantle of the fight for female suffrage. So Jess Phillips' recent hilarious self-aggrandizing intro to the Pankhurst biography describes how she conjures up the memory of Emmeline Pankhurst as she wanders past all the statues and paintings of men as she walks to a meeting in the, in the House of Commons, the UK Parliament. And she says this, I arrive characteristically late at committee room 16. I open the heavy wooden door from the silent dark corridor to a brilliant contrast. A big light room full of women. The room is so full, people are standing. Only one seat remains free. The raised seat in the center of the crescent at the front of the room. The seat reserved for the chair of this gathering. The room falls silent and I take my seat at the chair of the meeting and we proceed to try to change the world. It's that view of the world that change comes from these great individuals such as her. Like most movements for change, history presents us with the erroneous view of the movement to win the vote for women. History presents it as the result of a gradual process of enlightenment by an educated middle class minority who win and sacrifice on our behalf. As always, this is a distorted view of the past intended to dull the struggles we have today and in the future. Because the reality is that most of the impetus for the campaign for suffrage in the UK came from the radical, radical traditions of the working class stretching back over 100 years. How do I help? Sorry, I'm just sorting my screen share. Sorry. So when the hastily assembled petty bourgeois thugs of the Manchester and Salford Yeomanry attacked the monster march of 60,000 people for the right to vote in August uh, 1819, where they killed at least 16 and injured hundreds of more, that this became known as the Peterloo Massacre. There were many female campaigners in the crowd holding banners and Mary Fields from the Manchester Reform Union was on the platform that day to speak. In the earliest mass working class movements in history, the Chartists in the 1830s and the 1840s, the first iteration of the movement's demands were for adult suffrage. For many, this included the demand for women too. 
and the phase of the campaign that would give birth to the Women's Social and Political Union in Manchester in 1903 was actually initiated by the working class women of Lancashire, Cheshire and Yorkshire in the 1890s. Really, until this point, trade unions after the defeat of Chartism were marked by their conservatism. They were largely confined to skilled workers and were very sectional, interest in the, interested only in the very narrow economic demands of skilled workers. This meant a minority of men. But the wave of struggle unleashed by new unionism in the 1880s changed that to some extent. Famously, this wave of struggle was led by some of the poorest, most casualised and youngest female workers in the UK, the match girls of the Bryant and May factory in East London, who lit a flame when they went on strike, a cause championed by Eleanor Marx, amongst other socialists. This led to a spate of struggles elsewhere amongst previously non-unionised workers, such as blanket weavers in Yorkshire and women cigar makers in Nottinghamshire. And in 20 years, the number of women in trade unions increased by 400%. And this was especially strongest in, in the most collective workplaces that existed for women, the cotton mills of Lancashire and Cheshire and the woolen mills of Yorkshire. And there were amazing stories of radical women who led the struggles for better paying conditions for working women and end to rampant sexual harassment in the workplace and for political rights. And many of these women gave birth to the suffrage movement from which the suffragettes, the name commonly, you know, that the WSPU are known as, emerged and later broke from. For these women, suffrage was not an abstract political idea about equality with men or ever simply about political or legal equality. For many of them, such equality was not really very desirable, given that most working class men suffered equally hor horrific working conditions, the fear of unemployment, and they lived alongside these men in overcrowded and unsanitary housing. Suffrage for them was part of their wider struggle to fight for a better world. And I'd really recommend this book, Brilliant History from Below book on the suffragist movement, as distinct from the suffragettes, one hand tied behind us. And Liddington and, Liddington and Norris quote one of the leaders of S Selina Cooper speak at an open air meeting in Wigan outside Manchester. And she said this. Women do not want their political power to enable them to boast that they are on equal terms with men. They want to use it for the same purpose as men, to get better conditions. Every woman in England is longing for a political freedom in order to make the lot of the worker pleasanter and to bring about reforms which, which are wanted. We do not want it as a mere plaything. And for many of these women, it was intimately connected to the struggle for socialism too. You could do entire meetings on these women. They're really inspiring figures, such as Ada Neil Chu, who was a tailoress in Crewe, who first got involved in struggles when she was a whistleblower on the sweatshop conditions in her first job as a woman in the early 20s. She wrote a number of letters as factory girl to a local newspaper exposing low wages and the degradation of peace, peace work in a campaign that became a sort of a local cause celeb that activists in Bunnings in Sydney this year have become over their refusal of the bosses to shut down their unsafe workplaces. It kind of got that level of attention. And in a campaign led by Eleanor Marx and the Gas Workers Union, Ada won her job back after she outed herself as factory girl and also won better conditions in the workshops. Selena Cooper, who I mentioned earlier, was a mill worker who from the age of 10 got involved in organising. She was one of the first women to attend TUC conference and fought for support for women's right to vote there. Helen Silcock was the president of the Wigan, Wigan Weavers Union and Sarah Dickinson got involved in struggles in the 1880s when she led a strike in a factory over bosses trying to make workers pay for their own stools that were mandated after a factory inspe inspection. So these women worked in different trade unions and organisations, but were brought together with radical suffragists and socialists, especially Esther Roper and Eva Gore Booth, to form the Lancashire and Cheshire Women's Textile and Other Women's Representative Committee in, in 1903. Quite a mouthful. 
85% of all organised workers, in uh, women workers in England, were in the cotton unions, over 90%, 90,000 in total. And they became the backbone of the radical campaign for suffrage. Leaders of a movement had so often been the case with textile workers from Russia in 1917 to Myanmar in 2021. And between 1900 and 1906, these suffragists ran a really seriously impressive campaign amongst the most organised sections of women workers, which had a massive impact on winning the argument in the wider labour movement. So if the sectionally skilled trade unions represented the political conservatism of the British trade union movement, the radical suffragists pointed to the alternative. And they started in the small mill towns where they were active trade unionists and went door to door, workplace to workplace, pulling together great petitions to parliament and delegations for the right to vote. And in the Liddington and Norris book, they say, within a year, the petition they took to parliament looked like a garden roller in dimensions. They linked up with other suffrage groups elsewhere in the country and with socialist groups to hold open air meetings to argue for their cause and galvanised thousands of women to take part in demonstrations, to raise the issue in every election in their area and carry their arguments into, their, into the entire working class. And they did this despite victimisation by bosses, despite the massive pressures on their lives of going to work all day, going home and having families to look after. That's why the book is said one hand tied behind us. They were working exhausting jobs, then going home to families to feed them and go out every night campaigning for the vote. And as with any movement, there were different positions about how best to get the vote for all women. Some, some believed they should focus on mobilising women workers and thus were arguing for a vote for all women. Others thought the best way was to fight for adult suffrage. And I think the debate is often you know, seen as a left-right split on women's suffrage versus adult suffrage. I don't think it was as clear as that because some of the most progressive people supported universal suffrage, but also some of the most backward sectional trade unionists who count opposed adult suffrage to the campaign by these women trade unionists, really just to block any campaigning for female suffrage inside the unions. So on the one hand, the female suffragists won support from sections of male trade unions and could stand a Labour candidate in a Wigan by-election that came second, beating the Liberals. This is at the birth of the Labour Party in Britain. You had the Tories and the Liberals, who were basically two both ruling class parties. And on the other hand, there were three times that Selena Cooper attended the TUC and put motions for female suffrage, but each time her motion was defeated by one calling for adult suffrage. And abstractly, this seemed a better position, but in reality, the motions were passed and not acted on. They were put by sections of the trade union bureaucracy who had no intention of fighting for the massive working class to get the vote. It was a way of putting off the campaigning. What none of these suffragists argued for was the idea that the campaign should be limited to be about votes on the same basis as currently held by men. Because this would have granted only 5% of working class women the right to vote because of the property qualification. And this position differentiated these suffragists from the suffragettes which grew out of and then consciously rejected this more radical tradition. So initially, as Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters, Christabel and Sylvia and Adela, and the Pethlick Lawrences, their friends with others, when they established the WSPU, they had there had been links between the suffragists and the Pankhursts, such as calling mass demos, joint mass demos in Manchester, London and elsewhere. But quickly, the WSPU became not one of many organisations working together for the same goal, but an organisation that became determined to dominate the movement and really smash the influence and, uh, uh, and the ability to organise for these other groups. And because it was created as a deliberate break of Emmeline and Christabel Pankhurst from their roots in the Independent Labour Party, which was one of several socialist groups at the time. <laughs> 
it was a right wing break which thought to take the movement in an entirely different, less radical direction. One that sought to accommodate the demands of the campaign within the framework of the existing system, even if they did employ in the later years militant tactics. As I said, initially they worked alongside other groups, but it didn't take long for the uncoupling from their campaign, but from the, in the, you know, the campaign based in the radical sections of the working class to shift the politics of the suffragettes in a less rad radical direction. And I use the word radical deliberately as distinct from militant because the trajectory of the suffragettes demonstrates that militancy is not automatically radical or left wing. And in this case, it led to the overshadowing and demobilizing of the more radical campaign. And this manifested itself on a number of fronts. Really, the campaign led by the suffragettes became a different one for fighting for votes for all women to vote on the same basis as men, as opposed to adult suffrage or votes for all women. And this was a really conscious break from fighting for votes for working class women. As I said, 40% of all women getting the vote actually translated to 5% of working class women because they didn't, they, office, they didn't own property or rent it in their name. And one leading suffragette commented that the, that the campaign slogan, votes for women, actually meant votes for the ladies. Also, the suffragettes broke from the politics of looking to the labour movement, the trade unions and socialist societies as a base of the campaign. Their move from Manchester to London was a big part of this. And it quickly led to a demobilising of mass protests and connecting the political campaign to the other struggles inside of the working class. Christabel Pankhurst was the person who most argued this, and she was adamant that working class women were the weakest in society and the movement should seek to mobilise the educated elites. Re actually, a really appalling position if you think that these working class women worked all day, looked after their families and went out night after night fighting and all day at the weekends fighting to, to build the campaign. And the tactic of key activists committing individual acts of heckling liberal speakers, chaining themselves to the railings of parliament, smashing shop windows and later going to prison. These were designed to shame the liberal government and politicians into action. So the campaign moved away from winning the mass of people to the cause to narrowly focusing on persuading ruining class men and women. The WSPU did involve some working class women, but it was at individ as individuals, so the most famous one being Annie Kenny, because this kind of action relied on women who did not have to go to work, possibly lose their jobs or be blacklisted or, have their, or threatened with having their children taken away from them. And increasingly, the WSPU was a top-down authoritarian organisation whose every action was directed by Christabel Pankhurst. Annie Kenny commented favourably on this. She said, an autocracy suits my conservative, liberty-loving nature. The true and inner secret of the militant movement was that we were an autocracy. No committee has or ever won or ever will run a revolution. And the brutal treatment of the suffragettes when they use militant actions is an absolute indictment of how deeply rooted sexism was and is in capitalist society. So of it, most notoriously, there was the Cat and Mouse Act, which was specific legislation designed to break their hunger strikes. And this was horrific treatment of the suffragettes by the men of their class. It involved feeding them with hoses forced down their throats, releasing them when, until they were fully recovered, then re-imprisoning them. And this demonstrates how far the ruling class will go to protect the status quo. But standing with these women against the sexism of ruling class men is not the same as cheerleading any movement of the oppressed, especially one that sought to undermine the efforts to win the votes for all working people and was avowedly working against that movement as a way of persuading their own classes to grant them their rights. <laughs>
So Theresa Billingham, who had worked closely with the Pankhurst in the ILP, left the suffragettes in 1907. And I think she put it really well when she argued, it has cut down its demand from one of sex equality to one of votes on a limited basis. It has suppressed free speech on fundamental issues. It has gradually edged the working class element out of its ranks. It has become socially exclusive, punctilious, I can't say that word, correct, gracefully fashionable, ultra respectable and narrowly religious. Movements are never uniform and the demands raised by different sections within them reflect the different interests of individuals and groups within them. The suffragettes were seeking the vote for their class and they were prepared to pull the ladder of equality up behind them once they achieved it. Furthermore, the problem with the tactics of individual acts, such as throwing yourself under the king's horse at the derby, is that it reflects a worldview that suffering is a way to bring change, as though this would somehow appeal to the humanity of the suffragette leaders, brothers, husbands and fathers. The death of Emily Davidson in this way meant absolutely nothing to the men responsible for the expansion of the vicious British Empire, who were engaged in the mass military build-up that would later lead to the slaughter of World War I, only a few years later. Also, it's not that, like this tactic was used to mobilise the wider movement. You know, the civil rights movement in America in the 60s, in their struggle to end segregation, did use things like mass jailings. But as the movement went on, people like Martin Luther King saw these acts as futile if it was not used as a tactic to radicalise and mobilise people beyond the prison walls. Even if this had been the intention of the campaign, this just wasn't possible when your campaign was as limited in scope and appeal as the suffragette one was. It's really not very mobilising to ordinary women to say, well, we're getting the vote for ourselves now because somewhere over the rainbow, this will get you your vote. And suffering was used as a moralism to silence any criticism of the politics of the strategies of the suffragettes. How could you dare question the tactics of those who had been to jail repeatedly or dishonour the memory of those who had died at the hands of the state by arguing for different strategies? But also this was consciously against mass mobilisations and determined at every, at every turn to block and stop other parts of the movement. And Christabel Pankhurst in particular was not, was not just for mobilising the middle class, but she was rapidly anti-working class and the struggles for the rights of working class men and women at this time. And during the mass strikes uh, in 1911, which were termed the great unrest, she advocated for those who led strikes to be jailed and for new legislation to make this easier. So the Pankhurst swung between outlandish public acts such as slashing paintings in the National Gallery or digging up exclusive golf courses. I must confess I've been tempted to do that given it's one of the few things that's been open in the Sydney lockdown and meeting with members of the Liberal government, putting the brakes on campaigning when they were offered a hearing and then switching back to attempting to wreck the Liberal election campaign in 1910. But this wasn't done on a left-wing basis, but often from the right. So in many uh, occasions, they ensured Conservative candidates won in seats where they were the main opposition. And they treated the rest of the movement and the mass of their supporters as a light bulb they could switch on and off with increasingly diminishing returns. So, for example, despite the re-elected Liberal government being a minority government after the 1910 election, the government could readily torpedo a conciliation bill to allow votes for women on the same basis as men. And I read in uh, Ra Rachel Holmes' book on civil, uh, Sylvia Pankhurst that one cabinet minister commented that they could do this easily because they weren't under pressure from a large movement such as Chartism had been. That's the impact that the suffragettes had had on the wider movement. And this determination to oppose any campaigning that was not about the special, special few, included turning on Sylvia Pankhurst and others who tried to build mass campaigns and fight for universal female suffrage or adult suffrage. So the umbrella movement of which the suffragettes were nominally a part of contained many different elements. 
But like all movements, when it was connected to other struggles, this made it much stronger. So whilst Christabel Pankhurst was advocating for the destruction of working class organisation, the great unrest gave, gave new life to more radical ways of organising. In the same way that the struggles for equal pay, abortion and free childcare in countries such as Australia and Britain in the 1960s were strengthened by the radicalisation of other movements elsewhere. And it was Sylvia Pankhurst's involvement in these struggles, such as speaking alongside Irish revolutionary trade unionist James Connolly at solidarity meeting for locked out Dublin, trans Dublin transport workers during the great unrest, as well as her belief that the movement should focus on the mass mobilisation of working class women that led Christabel to expel her in 1913. So Sylvia Pankhurst had established the East London Federation of Suffragettes shortly before she was expelled. She was influenced by the radical women workers movement she'd seen on a recent tour of the USA. Christabel and Emmeline kept shunting her off out of the way because they hated the things she was trying to do. And this included a four month strike by 45,000 garment workers in Chicago, which was part of a mass radicalization following a terrible factory fire in Triangle Shirt uh, Waste Factory in New York, where 146 mainly immigrant working women died. And Sylvia said, I wanted to rouse these women of the submerged mass to be not merely the argument of more fortunate people, but to be fighters for their own account, despising mere platitudes and catch cries, revolting against the hideous conditions about them, and demanding for themselves and their families a full share of the benefits of civilization and progress. And East London was a really ideal place for this to happen. This campaign had much more in common with that organized by the Lancashire trade unionists and socialists. Uh, a third of women, only a third of women worked as domestic servants in East London. This was much smaller than elsewhere. And the campaign got a base amongst textile workers, clerical workers, teachers, and women employed in low levels of commerce. This campaign linked suffrage to the wider conditions of working class women to rent strikes, to campaigns for social security. It involved men and it focused on working class organization. And for this, Sylvia was summoned to Paris where Christabel was evading police arrest and she was directing the WSPU from there to be told, there is room for everybody in the world, but conflicting councils inside the WSPU, there cannot be. And so she booted her out and yet, Silverbell, Sylvia's refusal to openly criticise the suffragettes till years later, really, their tactics and their fight in the wider movement meant there were limitations of the ability of the East London Federation to offer an alternative model. So it meant that the potential moment of the great unrest to fight for the leadership of the movement publicly and make direct links between the fight for suffrage and labour and the fight for these and Irish home rule at a time of a weakened Liberal government were never fully exploited. And this was a reflection really of the weakness of the suffragists as a whole and really as a consequence of the strengthening of reformism inside the working class because they very much looked to simply the Labour Party and not struggle itself as the key to winning the vote. So the Labour Party's growth in this period was one that nearly all socialists saw as the key for bringing radical change. But it was a formation that was solidified, not by radical groups that looked to extra parliamentary activity, but by the trade union bureaucracy and the growing number of parliamentarians. And this led to really a separation of political and economic struggles that had marked the working class movement in Britain ever since Chartism, and this separation got stronger as more Labour MPs were elected and hopes for reform were more centred on parliamentarianism than ever. So the more radical wings of the movement that still looked to mobilising from below did so in the hope of convincing Labour politicians, not by the force of struggle itself. The collapse of so much of the movement the suffragettes in particular, into a truce 
to stop campaigning in the face of the need for national unity when World War I broke out, more than anything points to why a break from reformism and more openly critical response to the suffragettes weren't split in the movement, but the only way that the movement could have won. And there's much debate about why women were given the vote, even in a limited way, at the end of World War I. Conventional historians comment that it's a reward for women's role in World War I. And it's certainly true that, women, that World War I led to massive changes in women's lives. So the number of women transport workers increased by 4,000%, for example, and over 1 million women worked in munitions and other essential industries. But most of these women didn't get the vote after World War I. I think that as Tom Bramble and Mick Armstrong argue in their recent wonderful book, The Fight for Workers' Power, the ruling classes across Europe faced a dangerous situation. And in their book, they quote David Lloyd George, who was the British Prime Minister, and he put it like this. The whole of Europe is filled with the spirit of revolution. There is a deep sense, not only of discontent, but of anger and revolt amongst the working men against the pre-war conditions. The whole existing order in its political, social and economic aspects is questioned by the masses from one end of Europe to another. So where ruling classes could, concessions were the order of the day and the extension of the vote to nearly all men and some women in the UK, I think, were a part of this. And as I asserted at the start, this was not a radicalism that the suffragettes contributed to in any way. On the contrary, the Pankhursts actively disbanded their organisation in the whipping up period of the pre-war and they changed the name of their publication to Britannia. Emmeline Pankhurst directed her supporters to give white feathers to conscientious objectors as a visible sign of their cowardice. And actually, Emmeline's love for the war knew no national boundaries. She took herself to Russia to campaign for the provisional government to stay in the war after the February Revolution. And she ended her political career as a member of the Conservative Party. And she sometimes went to North America and Canada to lecture young people on the need for chastity. Sylvia's connection to the working class led her in the opposite, opposite direction. And by the end of World War I, she'd moved from a pacifist position to a belief in revolution. Like millions around the world, she was inspired by the Russian Revolution and was a founding member of the Communist Party of Great Britain. So, to conclude, the idea that the suffragettes offer a model of a successful campaign to fight for women's rights is a lie. Even on an issue that seemingly cuts across class lines, a universal issue such as a political right, there is no unity of the oppressed. Bourgeois women had different goals, different strategies, and were avowedly anti-working class in their desire to achieve them. The fight for women's liberation was, and always will be, bound up with the struggles against capitalism as a whole. And those that have understood those links and fought, a lot, have fought along those lines are the real heroes of the fight to emancipate women. 